A few days after they finished the castle, Janice Avery fell down in the school bus and yelled that Jess had tripped her as she went past. She made such a fuss that Miss Mrs. Prentice, the driver, ordered Jess off the bus, and he had to walk the three miles home. When Jess finally got to Terabithia, Leslie was huddled next to one of the cracks below the roof, trying to get enough light to read. There was a picture on the cover which showed a killer whale attacking a dolphin. What you doing? He came in and sat beside her on the ground. Reading? I had to do something. That girl! Her anger came rocketing to the surface. It don't matter. I don't mind walking all that much. What made what was a little hike compared to what Je what Janice Avery might have chosen to do. It's the principle of the thing, Jess. That's what you've got to understand. You have to stop people like that. Otherwise, they turn into tyrants and dictators. He reached over and took the whale book from her hands, pretending to study the bloody picture on the jacket. Getting any good ideas? What? I thought you was getting some ideas on how to stop Janice Avery. No, stupid. We're trying to save the whales. They might become extinct. He gave her back the book. You save the whales and shoot the people, huh? She grinned finally. Something like that, I guess. Say. Did you ever hear the story about Moby Dick? Who's that? Well, there was once this huge white whale named, named Moby Dick. And Leslie began to spin out a wonderful story about a whale and a crazy sea captain who was bent on killing it. His fingers itched to try and draw it on paper. Maybe if he had some proper paints, he could do it. There ought to be some there ought to be a way of making the whale shimmering white against the dark water. At first, they avoided each other during the school hours, but by October they grew careless about their friendship. Gary Fulcher, like Brenda, took great pleasure in teasing Jess about his girl friend. It hardly bothered Jess. He knew that a girl friend was somebody who chased you on the playground and the and tried to grab you and kiss you. He could no more imagine Leslie chasing a boy than he could imagine Mrs. Double-Chinned Myers shin shinning up the flagpole. Gary Fulcher could go to you-know-where and warm his toes. There was really no free time at school except recess, and now that there was no races, Jess and Leslie usually looked for a quiet place on the field and sat and talked. Except for the magic half hour on Fridays, Recess was all that Jess looked forward to at school. Leslie could always come up with something funny that made the long days bearable. Often a joke, often the joke was on Mrs. Myers. Le Leslie was one of those people who sat quietly at her desk, never whispering or daydreaming or chewing gum, doing beautiful schoolwork, and yet her brain was so full of mischief that the teacher could could have once seen through that mask of perfection, she would have thrown her out in horror. In horror, Jess could hardly keep a straight face in class, just trying to imagine what might be going on behind that angelic look of Leslie's. One whole morning, as Leslie was had related it at recess, she had spent imagining Mrs. Myers on one of those fat farms down in Arizona. In her fantasy, Miss Myers was one of those foodaholics who would hide bits of candy bars in odd places up the hot water faucet, only to be found out and publicly humiliated all before all the other fat ladies. That afternoon, Jess kept having visions of Mrs. Myers dressed only in a pink corset being weighed in. You've been cheating again, Gussie, the tall, skinny di directress was saying. Mrs. Myers was on the verge of tears. Jess Aarons! The teacher's sharp voice punctured his daydream. He couldn't look at Miss Myers as straight in her pudgy in her pudgy face. He crack up. He sets his sight on her uneven hemline. Yes'm. He was going to have to get coaching from Leslie. Mrs. Myers always caught him when he was when his mind was on vacation, but she never seemed to suspect Leslie of not paying attention. He sneaked a glance up that way. Leslie was totally absorbed in her geography, ge geography book, or so it would appear to anyone who didn't know. 
Terabithia was cold in November. They didn't dare build a fire in the castle, though sometimes it they would build one outside and huddle around it. For a while, Leslie had been able to keep two sleeping bags in the stronghold, but around the 1st of December, her father noticed their absence, and she had to take them back. Actually, Jess, Jess made her take them back. It was not that he was afraid of the Burks exactly. Leslie's parents were young, with straight white teeth and lots of hair, both of them. Leslie called them Judy and Bill, which bothered Jess more than, it, than he wanted it to. It was none of his business what Leslie called her parents, but he couldn't get used to it. Both the Burkses were writers. Mrs. Burke wrote novels and, according to Leslie, was more famous than Mr. Burke, who wrote about politics. It was really something to see the shelf that had their books on it. Mrs. Burke was Judith Hancock on the cover, which threw you at first. But then, if you looked at the back, it, there was her picture looking very young and serious. Mr. Burke <clears throat> was going back and forth to Washington to finish a book he was working on with someone else, but he had promised Leslie that after Christmas he would stay home and fix up the house and plant his garden and listen to music and read books out loud and write only in his spare time. They didn't look like Jess's idea of rich, but even he could tell that the jeans they wore had not come off the counter at Newberry's. There was no TV at the Burkses, but there were mountains of records and a stereo set that looked like some, something off of Star Trek. And although their car was small and dusty, it was Italian and looked expensive too. They were always nice to Jess when he, was, when he went over, but then... They would suddenly begin talking about French politics or string quartets, which at first he thought was a square box made out of string, or how to save the timber wolves and the red, or the redwoods or singing whales, and he was scared to open his mouth and show once and for all how dumb he was. He wasn't comfortable having Leslie at his house either. Joyce Ann would stare, her index finger pulling down her mouth and making her drool. Brenda and Ellie, Brenda and Ellie always managed to, some remark about girlfriend. His mother acted stiff and funny just the way she did when she had to go up to school about something. Later, she would refer to Leslie's tacky clothes. Leslie always wore pants, even to school. Her hair was shorter than a boy's. Her parents were hardly more than hippies. Maybelle either tried to push in with him and Leslie or sulked at being left out. His father had only seen Leslie a few times and had nodded to show that he had noticed her. But his mother said that she was sure he was fretting that his only son did nothing but play with girls and they were both worried that about what would become of it. Jess didn't concern himself with what would become of it. For the first time in his life, he got up every morning with something to look forward to. Leslie was more than his friend. She was his other, more exciting self, his way to Terabithia and all the worlds beyond. Terabithia was their secret, which was, good time, which was a good thing, for how could Jess have ever explained it to an outsider? Just walking down the hill toward the woods made something warm and liquid steal through his body. The closer he came to the dry creek bed and the crabapple tree rope, the more he could feel the beating of his heart. He grabbed the end of the rope and swung out toward the other bank with a kind of wild exhilaration and landed gently on his feet, taller and stronger and wiser in that mysterious land. Leslie's favorite place besides the castle stronghold was the pine forest. There, were the, there the trees grew so thick at the top that the sunshine was veiled. No low brush or grass could grow in the dim light, so the ground was carpeted with golden needles. I used to think this place was haunted, Jess had confessed to Leslie, the first afternoon he had revved up the courage to bring her there. Oh, but it is, she said. But you don't have to be scared. It's not haunted with evil things. How do you know? You can feel it. Listen. At first, he heard only the stillness. 
It was the stillness that had always frightened him before, but this time it was like the moment after Miss Edmonds had finished a song, just after the chords hummed down to silence. Leslie was right. They stood there, not moving, not wanting to swish the dry needles beneath their feet or break the spell. Far, far away from their former world came the cry of geese heading southward. Leslie took a deep breath. This is not an ordinary place, she whispered. Even the rulers of Terabithia come into it only at times of greatest sorrow or of great, greatest joy. We must strive to keep it sacred. It would not do to disturb the spirits. He nodded, and without speaking, they went back to the creek bank, where they shared together a solemn meal of crackers and dry fruit.